Hello and welcome everybody to another episode of the Handyman Success Podcast. My name is Jason Call, owner of Handyman Marketing Pros. I'm with my co-host Alan Lee, the owner of the Handyman Journey Business Coaching and Honestly Handyman Services in the Sacramento area. Uh, as you all know, if you've been tuning in for a while, our mission with the Handyman Success Podcast is to teach and inspire um, by using our guest stories and, and real practical tips and strategies of how they actually run their business that you know, hopefully from this, um, you can be inspired that, uh, you know, if you're new, that you can make this happen and be successful. Or if you're established, that you can reach the goals that you're trying to reach, overcome some boundaries that um, you're kind of stuck with. And so um, we hope that you will get some inspiration and some real practical business uh, improvement from our, our podcast here. Um, so today we're joined by Roger um, thank you so much, Roger, for joining us. If you don't mind uh, giving us a little lay of the land as far as um, you know where you are, your business name, um, and, and uh, we'll just start there. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, so my name is Roger Chong. I am the owner, uh, main operator of Built Right Furniture Assembly and Installation. Um, you know, the, the business is pretty much, uh, you know, we started officially um, in 2020 or so, it's been kind of a long road to get to, to where we are, but when it officially became a business was in 2020, um, started off with a bunch of different names uh, over the years. But, you know, as I kind of figured out branding and marketing in a very DIY approach, I kind of came to uh, built right furniture assembly and, and installation. Um, and so as you can tell by the business name, we specialize in furniture assembly and installation. Um, and uh, that really started off as a um, basic furniture assembly. So Ikea, Wayfair, Amazon, stuff you order in the mail, come in and uh, you give us a call and we'll assemble it. Um, and so that that was kind of like the, the main crux or the foundation of what my business, of what this particular business was when it started. Um, but it's pretty much grown into um, anything that can be installed into a home or a business. Uh, so that, you know, also includes things like uh, TV mounting, uh, decorating, um, anything that's basically not structural, that comes in a box, uh, that can be brought into the house is, is essentially what we specialize in. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of the present of, uh, of the business. And that's what we've been pushing strong at, at uh, for a while now. So that, that that's awesome. So you're currently doing uh, predominantly, you know, building furniture and stuff like that. Did you start out doing that in 2020? Or what was that like progression like? Did you start out doing general handyman stuff and then moved into that or or start with yeah that? so i mean uh, yeah like i said my, my journey uh, it's been kind of a long journey um so to get kind of rewind a little bit further um, i come from the world of film and television uh, i worked in production management for a while you know a lot of reality shows like wipeout the bachelor like those kind of things um hmm. i had my little you know career burnout kind of thing where i didn't know what i want to do with life i needed to step away from it because my quality of life wasn't that great and just out of sheer desperation i jumped into the world of being a handyman and this was back in uh, 20, 2015, 2016 or so. Um, and it just out of sheer desperation. It was literally just like me jumping on Craigslist, uh, throwing up a couple ads and just, you know, doing a few things here and there uh, for, you know, a few bucks to make ends meet. Um, and, and that's kind of where my journey into like, you know, working with tools and working with my hands started. Um, and then I was, I was doing handyman work, but as I was doing handyman work, um, I, I uh, th there was a couple kind of friction points as I was like figuring out what I really wanted to do in that world. Um, if, if, if even if it was the world I wanted to be in, as far as uh, you know, my income goes. Um, one of them was like I kept having to learn new things, which is great. You know, I'm not saying that's a bad thing at all. Uh, but like I just I kept having to learn new things. So it's like somebody needed a toilet changed, and I'm like, okay, I've never done one, but I'm just gonna hop on YouTube. Uh, really quick um, or somebody needed like a door installed so I needed to jump in jump on the internet and, and find it and uh, honestly uh, you know um, that, that's how I found uh, that's how I found you um, was because I would just YouTube you know I would just YouTube like how-to videos for everything and, and that was my process back in the day it was just like somebody hired me for a job two hours before I started the job I was just like okay how do you change a doorknob because <laughs> like awesome. I said like before I, I worked in film and tv like I barely even knew what a deck screw was I didn't uh -huh. know a drill I, I had like a $20 Ryobi drill like in the back of my mm -hmm. car and that's kind of like how it started so it's like I really didn't know what I was doing um but you know nobody ever called me because I broke a pipe ring like that so mm -hmm. I, I wasn't that bad <laughs> um and so but like I kept having to learn new things and like with that you know you just have to buy like more equipment I'm like oh well you know I don't have 
um, you know, I, I don't have spackle to like patch up a hole. I don't have like drywall compound. I don't have this and that. Mm. So like, I would constantly be having to buy new stuff. And it was frustrating because I would buy it. I would use it once and I would never get another job like that again. So I was like, ah, you know, I really got to like limit what I do. And when I kind of made that decision, I found that like, there was a lot of work for furniture assembly services. And I was like, okay, I can do this. It's super easy. I can get through it pretty fast. And people were paying pretty decent for that service. I'm like, I should just lean into this because it's it's the one job where like I'm not sweating bullets as I'm trying to figure it out. <laughs> you know, like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna worry about burning somebody's house down. I'm not gonna worry about like them like hurting themselves because I did something incorrectly or whatnot. Like um you know, the, the benefits to me just focusing on furniture assembly um, were uh, it just kind of overshadowed all, all the other, you know, opposite reactions to it. So that's why I just kind of leaned in heavy into that. And um, yeah, that was about 2020-ish or so, you know, roughly around the start of the pandemic. And uh, and it's it's worked out. Um, so, and it's, it's funny, it's, you know, I hope you guys don't kick me off the show, but like, I really <laughs> don't consider myself like a, a handyman business. Uh, mm-hmm. Because people will still call me and they'll be like, hey, can can you swap out a ceiling light for me? Or, hey, can you, you know, do this and that for me? And I, I do have to turn on work because, like, one, I haven't done it in years, so I don't feel comfortable, like, charging, like, my prices for those type of services that I can't guarantee. And two, it's like, I just, I'm not interested in that kind of work. I'm not interested in, like, mm-hmm. you know, putting that under my belt anymore. Uh, what interests me is kind of, like, getting better at what I wanted to specialize in. Yeah, yeah we're, we're definitely gonna have to kick you off because this is the handyman success podcast, <laughs> not yeah. the furniture assembly podcast. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, no, that was another thing too, was like, uh, before I found like, you know, your Facebook group and, and this whole world, um, I didn't really have a home. It was just like, um, right. th- there's not like a big market of just furniture assembly guys. Right. So I'm like, where do I belong? And then, um, you know, I, after a while, I was just like, well, I'm, I'm part of the handyman sector. I'm just like a, this very like small like corner of it. This very mm. specific niche of it. So you know, I'm like, okay, well, I, I can kind of I can jam with these guys hopefully, and hopefully they don't you know sniff out the wolf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's that's the beauty of the handyman trade though. Is like there's it's just de- it's almost every contracting like industry. It it's a niche of the handyman space. You know, yeah, yeah. It's so big, right? and then <laughs> drywall. Uh, so it's very common to uh, you know like a handyman that just, you've got to know what you can do and what you, what you don't do. Um, Mm -hmm. But I love how your, yours is really underscored by like what you enjoy and what you're happy to do and and provide that value for the client in the furniture assembly. Um, Where, so you're located in Southern California and like Los Angeles, is that right? Yeah. yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm in the Los Angeles, um, Orange County region. So it's just kind of like the main kind of area of of Southern California. Um, I'm based out of Long Beach, which is like right in the smack dab middle of Orange County and Los Angeles. Um, but, you know, I'll, um, like me and my team, we'll, we'll pretty much service most of Southern California, um, just really depending on the size of the job. Like I'll, you know, I'll, I'll send my guys down to like San Diego if it's a, a decent sized job, so, mm. which, you know, we've done before. Um, one, one question I have is, um, I mean, before we kind of dig into, I know we'd like to hear more about your, your business and your team and stuff like that. Um, but how what was the transition like um to kind of transition from a handyman to focusing on you know furniture assembly and being built right furniture assembly and installation like how, how what what did you do to make that transition like a reality oh i mean it was uh it was pretty immediate I, honestly i i would say it was like an overnight decision it was just like one day i think it was after a job where i was like um it's, somebody had like hired me to like do um like squeegee on like this decal onto a window but it was a very intricate decal and I completely botched it <laughs> and um I, w- I was just feeling like crap like so bad I'm like ah this is like this is a terrible job and then and, um you know that night I just sat down I'm like what can I do to like not feel this bad anymore um right. where I like I don't because I never had I, like I said like I never did it before I just read YouTube something and most of the time I succeeded but this time I failed I was like ah like what can I do to just like not feel this way anymore and not have to deal with like this type of anxiety anymore? And then I decided, I'm like, you know, I'm just going to lean into furniture assembly. Like, that's what, you know, that was good. I, that's what I enjoy doing. That's what it, I don't fail at, you know, like I'm really good at it. So it was like that night I made that decision. I, um, I changed my business name that night. I created a website that night, just like a really basic one on WordPress or whatever. And I just decided to push it. And like the next day onward, that's when I really just pushed it. So like, you know, when I was a handyman, I had like a super generic name. Um, it was like RBC services. Mm. Uh, 
So like, it, you know, it wasn't really anything. Um, and then that night I just, I changed it over to um, Ikea installers. Cause oh. you know, it was like, I was getting like a lot of Ikea stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. But that name didn't last long because they actually sent me a cease and desist letter when they found oh. it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. You don't want to get on the like bad two side. Months or like that. <laughs> You're going to um, get sued by Ikea. Yeah, 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 exactly. I got a letter from like like an attorney in Italy or something like that for their uh, yeah for their client. And I'm like, oh, okay, you know, I'm not even going to like fight this. I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to change the name. I was like, I, I, it was, I thought it was cheeky at first, but yeah, uh, lawyers don't find that funny. <laughs> so um yeah and so that's when it kind of just developed to to what it is now yeah so it was it was honestly yeah like like an overnight decision and like once I once I just made that decision I just leaned into it and I haven't really like looked back since mm-hmm. um you know I mean like I, I I mean like I occasionally do like handyman stuff here and there but it's really just for like return clients and friends that just really need a hand with something like that like they need um they need like a smart Door, like a smart doorknob or something like that installed i'll do that occasionally but like for the most part it's really just been like furniture assembly and and furnishing installations and um and especially now like i i got my um contractor's license so even now more so than before like i'm really not allowed to like touch anything outside of that scope of work um yeah the the contract or the state licensing board is very specific about like you um once you're a licensed contractor like you're you're that licensed contractor you can't get out of that license unless you get the license to cover the additional work so i i really use that as a question uh, when when people ask me to do stuff i can just i pull that card out and say like no i can't do that yeah i think that that's actually a very interesting thing about the california law and like i've had a lot of people ask me hey why don't you get your contractor's license and it's really because like in the law as a contractor you're not allowed to do Mm-hmm. general handyman stuff right you can yeah, only yeah. do the stuff that's covered under your co- under your contractor license so it's kind of like you're screwed if you do you're screwed if you don't like mm-hmm. you know you can either do handyman stuff and abide by that 500 hundred dollar limit here in california uh-huh. or you could be a, become a contractor but you can't do that small stuff kind of like general it's it's yeah, kind of yeah. crazy so I'm, I'm interested to hear you talk about that um so when you went so i i I always hear the question of people that want to niche down, right? Of how do you make that transition? Because one day you're doing everything and then the next day you're only doing this stuff. But it sounds like from your business, like you literally shut one business down and created a whole new one. Is that correct? Uh, Yeah, yeah. So I, I guess it, it down like that. I mean, like, you know, my phone number stayed the same. Like I stayed okay. the same. Uh, right. My clientele was pretty much... Um, I mean, my clientele pretty much stayed the same. So the people that had hired me as a handyman, a lot of them were hiring me to like build furniture anyways. Okay. So like, as they were calling me back, it was, it was for stuff that was still within my scope. So they needed me to like hang a picture at a really high height, or they need me to do like a, like a somewhat complicated job, but it was still within my scope. So, um, so I, I guess it was technically shutting down one business, starting another, but at the same time, like it didn't really feel different. It didn't feel like it didn't feel unnatural, you know, Mm -hmm. it felt like, it just felt like a continuation of my timeline. Um, So I didn't really have like any, I didn't have any hiccups um, Mm -hmm. when I made that transition. I didn't really, um, you know, have any hardships. Um, You know, one thing was like when I was doing my handyman stuff, I really didn't have a grasp of what it was to own a business. Mm -hmm. So when I was doing that and when I was like marketing myself, I didn't really know what I was doing. So I was Mm -hmm. throwing, I was throwing posts up on, Facebook. I was that guy in like city Facebook groups that are like, Hey, I can do that for you for five bucks. Or right. <laughs> um, I was just that guy. And I was just kind of like, I didn't really have like a process when it came to like marketing my business. Um, mm. It wasn't until like after I read a few books and really understood the concept of what it was to own a business. That's when I really focused on like going after my ideal client and my target audience. Um, so, you know, if anything, I built more of a base. I didn't really lose anything because I didn't mm. have to begin with when I was a handyman. I had, you know, no process whatsoever and now I, I have a much better process was there um when you made that transition was there like a down time as far as because like if you go from doing everything to the one thing mm-hmm. you know obviously a lot of the leads and phone calls you're getting like you're now turning those away so there was there uh, i guess if you could kind of explain was there any kind of like transition period where you know your revenue dropped because you're focusing now on furniture assembly and kind of figuring out the marketing for that you can kind of just shed a little light on that that specific piece of the trend. Yeah, yeah that specific wise. moment for sure. So like um yeah, like I said, like when um before I made that transition, I didn't know what I was doing as far as business goes. 
Um, so like I, I was busy. I wasn't that busy though. Cause I was still trying to figure out like how to do it. The jobs I was getting was just like for very like low paying stuff. Like I think I was making like 25 bucks an hour or something like that. And I thought that was good money. Um, but I didn't take into account like taxes and overhead fees and all that stuff. Um, so like, I, I didn't really know what I was doing. So like, I wouldn't say I lost revenue. Uh, it wasn't like things got, um, slower, but, um, once I, once I made that decision to like focus on furniture assembly, that's when I adjusted my marketing. And I, um, so, you know, it, to kind of get down into the granular detail. So like, uh, Yelp was a big driver of my revenue. Right. So, um, in the beginning, I, um, I would get, um, I would get a lot of increase on Yelp. I, I, I paid to sponsor my, uh, my page on there. I would get a lot of increase for like everything. So installing a whole new theater system, uh, patching drywall, all that kind of stuff. And like, um, I would throw out, I would throw out bids and it wasn't like, I wasn't getting like that much of a return. I was maybe getting like a quarter of them coming back and be like, okay, yeah, yeah, let's, let's move forward with this. Uh, but when I retooled and I focused my Yelp listing specifically just for furniture assembly and for TV mounting, um, it, it really, it didn't, it didn't spread the money out as far. It you just focused the money that I was spending on Yelp. And so in turn, I was getting more clients that were, um, that were just interested in just furniture assembly services. And they found, you know, the expert in furniture assembly services because they could see that that's all I was doing. So I was generating more uh, just through, just by focusing. So hmm. just changing my settings in my Yelp advertising, um, I was able to just reach the people that I wanted to, and I was able to get more of them versus hmm. kind of just generalizing and kind of like throwing my, you know, shooting my shot with everybody. I was just shooting my shot with the few that would be interested in my services. Mm -hmm. hmm. That's cool. awesome. And so you, you're a contractor. So what contractor's license is that for furniture assembly? Uh, so in California, um, it's a specialty contractor's license, uh, the D34 classification, which is pre-manufactured equipment installation. Okay. Um, so, uh, and, and um, the, the board, they kind of, um, in, in their quick pitch, of what the license is. It's basically anything that comes in a kit or anything that comes in a box um, is what I'm allowed to touch. Uh, okay. So that could be things like a closet system. So, you know, the stuff that you buy off the shelf. Oh, okay. Gizebo, um, Ikea. Or gazebos, I assume, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Exactly. Like so, but then uh, that also includes things like, um, you know, like the warehouse racks that, you know, mm -hmm. you can wear. Oh, right. Uh, kind of bigger installs like that. Um, uh, it, it would include all of that. So, you know, the, um, the possibility of like um, the, the the possibility to make more money on jobs is is bigger with the license because now I can go after like these larger scale jobs, um, you know that I wouldn't have been able to if I if I didn't have the license. I I could just see someone um, you know installing a fence and getting caught by the CSLB and then be like, but I bought all the material and I put it in a box and then it came <laughs> box. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I I had actually asked about that like before I got my license, and I was I was kind of going back and forth because you know uh, like um, there are companies out there that will like manufacture a custom closet for you if you send them uh -huh. like, the the measurements. Right. So I was like, if I just took measurements and I ordered a custom thing that was manufactured elsewhere, could I install that? And they're like, no, you can't do that. That's still custom work. So oh, man, so they, they're, they're very. Well, what I've learned about the CSLB is like if, <laughs> if it feels dodgy, it's probably not allowed. Like yeah, that's, that's what yeah. I mean. You have to ask a bunch of questions to work around it. It's yeah. probably it's probably not. Uh, you probably shouldn't do it. Right. It's like, well, can I do this or like, yeah, it's yeah. it's um, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. They got a lot of laws over there. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, is there a lot of people in that field that that say that have that D thirty four contracts license that are going after what you're going after? Like, what's the competition look like? Yeah. As far so as that, it's it's weird. That, so the D thirty four license, it's so broad. Uh, in, in the same way that like handyman like covers so many like different kind of like skill sets, mm -hmm. the D34, I, I had only recently found out that it also covers like appliance repair and installation. Mm -hmm. And I, I have no skill sets in appliances, but like, mm -hmm. like now I know that I, I'm allowed to like advertise my services for appliances. Um, but yeah, I mean, like um, the, the majority of D34 um, uh, people have, um, you know, it's, I, I haven't done the market research to see like what the whole classification or what the whole group of people is, but um, looking through the website, I found it was like a pretty even mix of like closet installers plus like people that do like warehouse, like warehouse racks, um, okay. those kind of, like large installations uh, like that. So it is a lot more, um, it is a lot more commercial. Um, it's a lot more uh, like 
uh, uh, the type of people getting the D34 license aren't doing as much like residential, like they're not going to come in and just build like a single sofa, or, right? Like, you know, Karen in, in Irvine or something like that. Um, so Little they're Karen in Irvine. Yeah. <laughs> um, so on yeah, that so, note, Roger, uh, like yeah. I'm curious because I think most think furniture assembly, like I think of like, you know, household furniture from like mm -hmm. or Wayfair or whatever. Um, but what is like, what is your job distribution between uh, like residential and commercial? And then also in that vein, like, what is like a, what is like your ideal job? Like when it comes in, you're like, sweet, this is, this is what I'm going for. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, you guys actually caught me in a very like transitional period. And I, I had talked about this with Alan when I had breakfast with him the, uh, the other month. Um, it was like, I, I'm in this transitionary phase where I'm moving from like, mostly residential customers and I'm really pushing for commercial customers because what is most uh, profitable for me are larger scale jobs uh, where I can um, bring in like a larger team working in one location, building like the same stuff over and over again. Um, so it's like, you know, before um, where I would just get be called in to build like a desk and a bed frame for a customer, I'd have to like squeeze in like four to five clients in a day to really make like some decent money. But now, like, um, if I can get a customer that's building out a new office and they have 50 desks and they have 50 chairs to go with it and they have 50 filing cabinets along with a conference table and a few TVs and various offices, uh, that kind of job is more profitable for me because I can still I can still bang that out. You know, my team can bang that out in like a couple of days, but we would make I would make 10, you know, 10 times as much money as I would going to like five different houses. Um, so right now, um, I mean, it's. Uh, right now it's about 50 50 as far as like my my incoming revenue dollars uh like 50 percent of that right now is probably for residential customers 50 percent of that is for um commercial customers um i'm really pushing to like flip it so that it's mostly commercial because like i said like i you know you get a lot more income for a lot less work yeah um, that's you know that's the goal that means i can either just work less or you know have more money so one, one thought I have on this, I mean, just is what I would like, just an idea is uh, uh, like connecting with like owners of like commercial property buildings, you know, mm -hmm. those big commercial buildings that have people moving in and out all the time. Yeah. Uh, there's gotta be a ton of those where like, I'm sure you could like make relationships and become like, basically when someone's moving in uh, like, Oh, Hey, we're so excited that you signed our lease and you're moving in, you know, here's a few like you know, referrals that could help you in this transition. Anyway, it was just a thought that came up while you're talking about that. Yeah, you know, that, and that's totally a route too. I've been, um, you know, like I said, I'm still in this transition period. So it's like, I'm, I'm learning a lot as well. Um, and I, I, I'm finding that it's not as easy as just calling like the location itself. Um, but that's where I'm learning a lot too. Um, so there's like nation, I'm sure you guys know, there's like nationwide, like, home maintenance companies that like uh, are outsourced by like apartments and whatnot uh, to like do the repairs and home maintenance and stuff like that. Um, and I found that establishing relationships with other companies as a third party source is really beneficial. So like right now I'm like, I'm the sole service provider for like a desk manufacturer and a couple other hmm. like manufacturers. Um, uh, and um, I'm also like on the, I, I don't know, the list of people to call for like this national manufacturer that does like, that covers like my scope of work um, and establishing relationships with these other parties that get outsourced by the actual like customer itself. Yeah. Um, that's kind of where, that, that that's where I'm getting a lot of my commercial revenue. Uh, that makes sense. I, it's, I, I probably didn't do the best job of explaining that. Yeah, but, no, that yeah. makes sense, man. That's really yeah. cool. And I know uh, there's a lot of people too that are, have a focus on like smart home installation. They have yeah. a relationship with like as a preferred vendor for Nest, for example, yeah. that they know you're in that zip code. So when someone orders something, boom, your name is like, you know, in their like order confirmed and all that good stuff. Yeah, so ex exactly that. So there's a lot of those companies that specialize in just furniture, so especially like furniture manufacturers. Mm -hmm. um, they are, you know, like um, establishing, being the service provider for them is is a, like a really good relationship to lock in. So that's what I've been pushing for a lot more. Um, so I've got, a, you know, I've got partnerships with a couple of smaller manufacturers. I'm really trying to like lock in and bigger manufacturers, bigger, bigger partnerships and build bigger relationships. Um, and that's kind of my journey right now is kind of navigating my way through that and really building that. That's okay. It. 
Yeah. Uh, if you don't mind kind of like talking about this a little bit more, I think it's really cool. Um, mm -hmm. Like what, what, like, what are you doing specifically, I guess, outside of those relationships? Is there anything else that you're doing to kind of have this focus and get more of those commercial jobs where you can make, you know, 10 times more than, you know, assembling the couch? Yeah, for sure. I mean, so like uh, the great thing about uh, doing B2B versus B2C is that like, uh, phone numbers and email addresses are a lot more publicly available. So like, mm -hmm. I don't know if like Karen down the street needs a bed frame assembled and I don't know what her phone number is. So I can't, I can't call her and ask her like, Hey, do you need help? But I know that like this desk manufacturer that manufactures desks and sells it all across the country. I know that that's what they do. That's their business. I right. know what the number is because it's on their website. Um, I could probably find like the, the email address for the operations director or something like that. So I have, I have a way to get a hold of them. Um, and so with that, like, I've really been pushing like outbound marketing, um, you know, cold calling, essentially, um, mm -hmm. cold calling, cold emailing, uh, a little mix of both. Um, and um, that's been kind of like my main way of getting to those people. I, I put aside a few bucks um, in like, just general, like PPC advertising, uh, in case like those people are just Googling like furniture assemblers near me or something like that. Um, I haven't really gotten too many hits from that. Um, but for the most part, just reaching out to them and not waiting for them to reach out to me, that's really been what's been working. That's, that's what worked with like the couple relationships that I have been able to assemble. Um, and then I have a bunch of like ongoing pending conversations with a bunch of other people as well, um, or a bunch of other companies as well. So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of like my process of like building that portion of my business. Uh, the big portion of it is just outbound calling, um, and uh, it's it's a little scary. I, I'll admit, you know, just cold calling people, mm -hmm. um, cold emailing people. It's I, I've had to read a lot about sales. I've had to read a lot about like you know understanding how to sell something, um, and that's you know kind of a new world for me. Um, you know, because before like before this, it was just like people will call me and say like I need a bed frame assembled. I'd give them my oh. price. I'd give them like why I would be like the best person to do it. But that's really about it. Whereas like now I'm you know, trying to tell these people like, Hey, this is, this really is why, you know, I'm licensed. I have, I have a one year warranty on the workmanship. Um, you know, we do this and we do that. Um, you know, I really try and build my value and like, I have to do it in a way that doesn't sound like a douchey salesman either. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. And, and I know when we were talking, we met at that Denny's and I was trying to wrap my brain around kind of what you do in this and that. And you could even like target companies like, like Denny's, right. To assemble, all their boots right when they first buy a building or whatever oh yeah yeah for sure so like um th this is something else I i've also learned too and i don't know if your listeners will compete on me with this but what i found is like with these large corporations and with these large um uh with these large customers so national chains like denny's mcdonald's uh hospitals uh when they're building something new they're going to be buying furniture at bulk from a specialized manufacturer and part of the contract, part of the sales agreement between like, uh, you know, when McDonald's says like, hey, we want, you know, 10,000 shares across all of our restaurants, we want to buy for this price, but with that price, we're going to need you to also include uh, white glove delivery or installation or assembly. Um, wow. That's, that's kind of how it works across the board. And with all the different people I've been talking to, the, the, the end user will actually uh, you know, force the manufacturer or the retailer, whoever they're buying it from, to include it as part of the sale of, you know, these million chairs, these million desks that need to be done. Um, so that's why it's so important to reach out to like the manufacturers of hmm. the manufacturers and the retailers that are selling the actual product to the end user, to the customer. So you don't necessarily need to call McDonald's, right? You know, but you call like the the person yeah, I, that McDonald's buys from, right? Yeah. So, um, and th I, I learned this because I tried to um, build a relationship with uh, the Los Angeles Unified School District. Mm. I'm like, how can I be the guy that builds all your chairs? Or what, what's it going to take for me to be that guy that you call when you need furniture assembled and all this? Mm -hmm. They actually have a whole department of people that are just focused on overseeing the work of furniture being installed. I'm like, <laughs> how can I be that guy for you? I'm like, oh, well, you wouldn't be the guy for us. You would be for the guy that we buy it from. So you mm -hmm. got these manufacturers and um have you know have them hire you like we wouldn't be the ones to hire um so yeah, yeah. so you would be calling the manufacturers i mean it, I'm, I'm sure it's case by case i'm sure there's some companies that probably keep all that in-house um but for the most part of with all like the executives and you know professionals i've been talking to that's what i've 
discovered is like the general, you know, way of how things work in this commercial furniture installation space. Very interesting. Very interesting. And uh, you were telling me when we were down meeting, um, you were telling me about some times when you've worked in like Catalina Island for a few uh, people. Can you tell us maybe a little bit about that and how oh, you got those jobs? Yeah, so th that that's one of the more rare instances where the end user actually hired me directly. And, and that's one of the rare instances where like my PPC advertising actually worked because they just found furniture assemblies in the area. Um, and so they, uh, the, the company that pretty much, um, you know, for, for those of, you know, for those listeners that don't know what Catalina Island is, it's a little island that's like 30 miles off the coast of Los Angeles. It's like a full-fledged town. Uh, people live there. It's like Hawaii, but not Hawaii, I guess. <laughs> um, so like, it, it feels like going to Newport Beach, but on an island. Um, and so like the, there's a company there that pretty much like handles like all of the, all the commercial spaces. Um, you know, they own the restaurants, the hotels and all that stuff. And so they were just, they were revamping a lot of their restaurants. And so they just found me through researching online. They found my pay, uh, they found my website. Um, and then, yeah, they, I just established my relationship with them because they, uh, they buy the furniture, but they're also in charge of like assembling it. And so that's why um, in that instance, um, the end user actually hired me. And so I, I made a few trips out there with my team. Um, I'm, I'm always more than happy to take a free boat trip anywhere on an island. <laughs> and it's, you know, and, and the good thing about that is like, you know, it, it moves by pretty quickly, the furniture that they get. So it gives me and my guys like two or three hours on an island just to hang out after we're done with the job because you can't go back until the boat's ready to go back. So, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. And so um, I'm, I'm hoping maybe you could dig into a little bit more about like pricing, you know, because like uh, we've talked a lot about pricing, like handyman jobs. Right. But as as we've learned, you know, you want to change this to the furniture assembly podcast. So uh, <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about like how you price furniture assembly and what that looks like? Because how do you know how uh, long something's going to take you or maybe yeah, try some uh, insight? I'm very much a big proponent of flat rate pricing. Um, I I understand why some guys would want to stick with hourly pricing or just charging by the hour. But, you know, like there's only 24 hours in a day. So there's like a cap on how much you can really make. Right. You know, person. And so that's why I, I've always been against hourly pricing. So I do flat rate pricing and um, I do it. Be, um, each type of furniture has its own price, has its own flat rate. So like mm -hmm. uh, a chair is a price, a bed frame is a price, um, you know, and it's like one flat rate. So whether it takes an hour or whether it takes like 30 minutes, it's going to be that same price. And um, I developed this pricing list just based off experience um, and just based off the averages of like what I know, how long it'll take to build it. Um, because I mean, the good thing about like furniture assembly, it's like, it's, it's a lot more predictable. And this is why I really like furniture assembly. It's like, it's a lot more predictable than like you change out a toilet. You could find like a rusty pipe underneath that you have to replace. Mm -hmm. or, you know, when you uh, patch a wall, you might find like there's rats behind the wall and you have to like clear that out or something like that. And like, you never really know going into it, like if there's going to be an issue. Um, but with furniture assembly, it's like, once you build a bed, you kind of built all the beds. Like once you built a dresser, you built pretty much like all of them. So you like, you know, what goes into it, you know what the pain points are. So it's like, um, that's why like, I feel comfortable with charging a flat rate for like any dresser or any desk. Um, all that requires is like, you know, me scoping it out with the customer. Um, like, is it a desk with drawers? Is it a standing desk? Or is it a bed with storage underneath? Or is it not a bed with storage underneath? And so like on my website, I, I literally just post all my prices. Like there's a whole pricing list on my website. So customers can go to the website and see like, oh, this is how much he charges for a bed. Um, like a chair, like for instance, like an office chair is like $40 to assemble, right? And it's a flat rate, no matter if it takes like, you know, 10 minutes or if it takes an hour, it's, it's never gonna take an hour. But um it's like, uh, like they'll know like it's $40 per chair. So if you have 10 chairs, it's going to be 40 times 10. And usually mm -hmm. bigger quantities, I'll, I'll mark down a little discount because like I said, like the more there is a one item, like I can just, you know, my team can just do it faster because we're just in one location. But um, yeah, um, it, everything has its own price. And, and that's based on like me knowing like on average, it takes, you know, half an hour to do this or 45 minutes to do that or an hour and a half to do that and right. that price is based off of times what i need to you know make hourly to you know cover the business yeah okay. okay so it so i'm just thinking like you know say you got it's x amount for a dresser right but they have a little bit bigger of a dresser right than normal is it like 
how many like depending on how many drawers they have and then you add on like per drawer like say the uh, typical dresser has nine drawers and this this one happens to have 12 drawers like um, how yes. do you for every do piece of furniture there is variations of it so like okay. dresser for example um uh, they, they they do vary in size and people have people buy different sizes of all sorts. So my flat rate pricing is for dressers up to four drawers. It's, oh. Yeah, dressers up to four drawers. I, I don't have the pricing list in front of me, but it's like, it's $120 because it takes like half an hour to do that. Right. Uh, for dressers uh, with five drawers and more, um, it's like 160 bucks or something like that. So mm -hmm. just an extra half hour or less than that uh, to do that. Um, like with the, uh, for desks, you know, you can have a standard desk, you can have a desk with a return hutch, you can have a desk that's just a standing desk, electrical or non-electrical. Um, so there's variations of each type. Oh. Um, and so that's, um, and that's kind of what I base my pricing on. But like, I'll know that if it's just a standing desk without drawers, uh, it's going to take 30 minutes. If, it, if it's a desk with a hutch and return, it's going to take like an hour and a half to do oh. on average. Um, and usually um, in the beginning, that was, there was like a lot of like, you know, learning through that process. And I definitely lost money on some jobs. Um, but, you know, over time, I just kind of figured out like, no, this is the average. And I've been pretty accurate about that. And so mm -hmm. that's why I'm really confident when it comes to like pricing my services, because uh, like 90% of the time, like it goes as expected. There is 10% of the time that we're like, something will happen where like, it's going to take longer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like there's, there's something wrong with the packaging. So I have to like fix like an issue that was caused by the manufacturer or something like that. Um, but you know, like if I'm winning, you know, eight jobs and I'm losing two jobs, as far as like, you know, what I'm making out of it, then it's, you know, it, it, it works out in the end. So, yeah. Um, so I, you know, I don't do furniture. I mean, we do furniture assembly as one of our services, but we don't like niche down and focus just on that. So sometimes we've had some crazy doozy ones. Like I remember one time someone hired us to, uh, assemble this really big Ikea dresser. And we looked at reviews. We figured it would take us like three hours. Uh, it took me like six hours to do that puppy. Like it was absolutely insane. So have you ever had a job like that where like it took you way longer than you thought? And can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, so the I, Ikea has a closet system called the Ikea pack system. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with it. Um, and it's like their custom closet system. Um, but it's just like they, you know, they have the frames and everything is like... Um, you know, you customize the insides essentially and which frames go with which. Um, and um, I, I do have to go into it assuming the customers have measured properly. Um, and I'll, I would say maybe 25% of the time they don't measure properly. Hmm. Uh, th they'll forget things like, you know, like walls aren't perfectly plumb, you know. And so like that half inch, like makes me not able to like push in a frame all the way. Um, and so that requires some creative solutions to, to make it work. Um, yeah, one time I had to like, I literally took a sander and I shaved down the drywall and things uh -huh. like it look ugly because it's behind the frames anyways. Right. But like I would do that. I would literally just chip away at walls or I would, I, I try not to like remove baseboard, but if I have to remove it, I'll remove it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I charge extra for that as well. Um, but it's just things like that. So like, um, yeah, one job, it was like, she had mismeasured by a half inch or so, um, or the bottom of, I think it was the bottom of the, the wall, like, you know, curved out a lot more on the top of the wall. Oh. And it didn't allow me to like make this perfect, like U shape in their walk-in closet. And, um, you know, like I could have just like went back to her and like, uh, you got to reorder or we got to send this back or, you know, I can't do this. Um, but it was just like, a part of me was like, ah, it's only like a half inch. Like I, I got to figure this out. <laughs> And so that took me, um, I don't know, that took like an extra hour, hour and a half maybe to like get a solution going. And I was just drenched in sweat afterwards. But <laughs> it also required me to like, and I, and I was working by myself on this project, but like I had to like lift up this whole frame by myself and kind of get in like this massive, like eight foot frame by myself and getting it pushed into place and um, knocking down and cutting out like shapes of the other frame to like make it work. <laughs> Um, it was it was a very complicated process because each step was like, okay, this isn't working. What can I do on like this next attempt to make it work? Um, and like that was just one of those things where like I I could have charged her um, extra for the additional work that I was doing, but I'm like I don't even know how to like quantify that. I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely uh, didn't make as much money on that job, 
but like the next job, the next day, installing the same system, I was done. Um, I was done maybe like an hour ahead of time because um, it, everything fit, everything worked. There was no problems. I was just in and out. Like she loaded everything up where it needed to be. Um, you know, it, everything was just like super smooth sailing. So you know, between the two jobs, it's just like I lost money on one, but you know, I gained a lot. I gained a lot of time on another one enough right. to squeeze in another quick job that somebody just called me about like um and so it's like i guess i, I made money uh, hmm. from the next day so it's like you know uh, that's what i'm saying like some eight out of ten jobs is going to work in your favor the the two out of ten is not going to work in your favor but it'll the universe will balance itself out hmm. or if, i don't know maybe i'm being too optimistic but <laughs> <laughs> well, that's exactly how i see it yeah you almost have to price your services to account for that 10 to 20 percent that you know it's just unpredictable there's just variability in business yeah exactly right. I, I i do do that there is that gap and, that, and that's why i'm saying like eight out of ten works in your favor like um so like for instance the chair that takes like forty dollars that i charge forty dollars for uh chairs take like 10 minutes to assemble so it's like um a lot of time and you might even be done in less than 10 minutes um a lot of times like you know, I, I don't know what the math is, but like it, it, it works out, it works out in your favor. And the one time it doesn't work out in your favor, all the other times it did work in your favor, it's going to like balance itself out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, I know we've got like about 10 minutes here, Roger. So I wanted to ask you, uh, I know you're, you're pretty passionate about like systems and processes. And so, um, I wanted to ask like, what, what kind of processes do you have in place that makes your business more efficient and just run better for you? Uh, yeah, so I think um, before, like when I said when I was doing my handyman business and I was just like all kind of like flying by the seat of my pants, um, I, I was very unorganized before. Um, and that that's when I was just like texting people like, hey, you owe me like you owe me 50 bucks for this job or something like that. <laughs> and they would just pay me cash, you know, like a very typical way of just kind of doing everything under the table. Uh, but there was a lot of times when I was just like missing appointments because I forgot that I scheduled an appointment this day. And so like the customer will call me like 30 minutes after the appointment starts and I'm like, I'm knee deep in built like mounting another TV or something like that. And I can't make it. And um, it just uh, like that instance just happened so many times. I'm like, I got to fix this. And, um, you know, when you're starting out, you're very resistant to paying for stuff because you just want to do everything for free. Mm. But I'm like, ah, you know, I got to get um, I didn't even know what it was called at the time. I'm like, I got to get a CRM. Um, and, um, so I was just like, but I didn't want to pay for anything, uh, cause I was just being a cheap but I'm like, you know what? I, I, I ended up just jump, you know, buying the bullet. I paid for a CRM and it was just a total game changer because, um, it just, it solved like all of the misorganization that I had. Um, so with my CRM, I, I use jobber by the way. Um, you know, I have a form online that customers can just fill out and it's just like, it's a book and appointment, but, and they just fill that out. It comes to me directly. Um, and then I can immediately right there I get on my phone and I can just like send out you know I can just send send back the quote and be like I have a guy that's you know I have a guy that's in your area he can be there in like two hours I'm like oh or I can schedule like next Tuesday or something like that um having that efficiency was such a big game changer and being able to do all of like the scheduling the estimating the pricing the invoicing all within like one app or one computer screen on my computer um really changed how efficient I was I wasn't dropping the ball I wasn't losing money because I would forget to show up to an appointment or something like that. Um, that big change in my process was probably what made it, me feel like I had like a business versus just me like, you know, answering a, an ad on Facebook or something like that. Um, hmm. So, um, so I created like this process of like the, the funnel of, of getting people from like searching my name to actually getting them booked into an appointment and then you know once i'm there on site or once my one of my guys are there on site you know um it's it's a pretty much straightforward process um but like i i had to make it like a uh, it I, I might go, go into the nitty-gritty of this but like you know it, it, there's a there's a process for like how to answer the door how to talk to the customer how to do the job itself how to keep your tools organized so you don't lose tools which still happen anyways um, but you know, how to keep everything organized during the service call itself and then how to wrap up the service call and then how to do like follow-ups. Like there's, there's just like a process for it. It definitely could be used for some more refining. You can definitely improve obviously. Um, but I found that like, once I figure out, like I needed like a repeatable way to like run a service call, um, it, it made the customer experience so much better as well. Hmm. Um, so yeah, finding the process of that was also, you know, important for the business and and yeah
And how do you get your your team to kind of follow? Um, you know, I, I don't think I have a special. I, I think I just have a good group of guys that like that just work with me and mm-hmm. understand like what I'm trying to do. Um, and uh, I don't know. They just they just do like I tell them like, hey, I want you know, I'd really love it if you could just talk to the customer this way. I'd really love it if you didn't uh, uh, talk to the customer this way or something like that. So like one one hard rule I have is to never bash customers purchases even Mm -hmm. even if you don't feel that way so like if they buy like a really dinky bed off of amazon that like looks super rickety it's going to fall apart like you're never going to say like oh yeah this bed's really this bed's really crappy anyways it's probably going to fall apart on you so you know don't fall in love with it too much you know um there's other ways to work around it like you know you're saying like oh this is you know uh this this bed's going to get you know this bed's going to last you you know through your whole time here at college or something like that like um, never just talking bad about a customer's purchase, especially even if they're talking bad about the purchase themselves. So like, like those are the type of things that like I try mm-hmm. and like my guys and they, they buy into it. So it's not like it's resistant. Um, if if I come across like um, a guy that doesn't want to buy into it, I'm I guess I'll cross that bridge when I, when I get mm-hmm. to it. But you know, so far I've just um, I've just had a good group of guys around me. What what are some examples, if you don't mind sharing, like uh, you mentioned, like when they go up, when you go up to the door and how like you, you know, that first interaction, like what are what are some points there? Uh, so I, I, I don't bring everything with. Um, so like uh, when, when I go to a service call, I don't bring up everything with me, but I, I have like a rolling toolbox. And um, like I said, like furniture assembly is really predictable. So I know what tools I'm going to need. Like you're always going to have your basics, drill, hammer, screwdriver, and all that stuff. But you, you'll know if you need a stapler. You'll know if you need like a specialty tool or something like that. You can load that up. And I always come up with just one toolbox. Even if I know like it's going to require a bunch of other stuff, I don't want to come to the front door with like 10 bags of like <laughs> hardware and all this stuff. Um, and I, you know, I knock on the door. I don't ring the doorbell. Um, and then, you know, when they answer the door and, you know, we go in, um, you know, I, I, uh, we'll either do booties or shoes off one or the other. And then um, I'll always start the conversation with a compliment or some sort of like icebreaker that isn't related to the job. So like something like, oh, I, I, I love the color of your car out there. I always want something like that. Or I love this neighborhood. My, my wife and I were looking at buying a house in this neighborhood, but like, you know, we just couldn't afford it. So like, but we'd love to live here one day. Um, just something like that before you jump into like the business of it to really like break down like the ice wall that like, you know, customers will have about having a stranger in their house for the first time. Um, mm-hmm. This was especially important though, during like the COVID era when like, you know, people weren't used to having people into their homes, let alone mm-hmm. somebody that's masked and you can't even see their face. Like it was really important just to build that friendly rapport. And you can do that so quickly with just saying like a simple line about like, oh yeah, you know, I, I used to have that bed in college. Like, that's oh, a great bed. Or like, oh yeah, I love this TV. I wish I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna get one for Christmas. Um, that really helps break that barrier. So that's, it's it's kind of minute, but like, you know, if, if you just kind of do that icebreaker and, you know, approach it that way. Um, yeah, I, I, I found that it helps. I, I, I even did like, I, I did testing between ringing doorbells and knocking on doors. And I found that like knocking on doors was more friendly, I guess. They mm. were, I, know, I felt like customers were a lot more, um, it, that helped break down the wall a little further. Uh, that could be anecdotal. I don't know if there's any science behind that, but I felt like, like knocking on the door and standing there with, you know, looking friendly is a lot better than ringing the doorbell and just like being impatient or something like that. <laughs> I don't know. It could be me. You, you guys might know better than me, but you know. Yeah, no, that's good stuff, man. I mean, I'm a, like any business, whether you're just by yourself or you have employees, like creating uh, patterns like that, like to provide, ultimately you're providing a consistent experience to every single client. So then, you know, as you grow, it's cookie cutter. Like, you know, because they follow these processes that they're going to get that same exemplary service as if Roger was there. So I love listening to these little nitty gritty things because it's it's like the icing on the cake, like the little icebreaker question. One of my yeah. favorites was uh, that was from Stephen Caps in our podcast. And I feel like I bring up every podcast is like, <laughs> it's okay if I park there, like just little, just these nuances within the customer experience, they, they add up and ultimately to create something that's consistent every single time. Yeah, the, the customer experience is so important, like, in, in my opinion, like, it's, the, the work is important, obviously, because that's what they hired you for, but I think at the end of the day, like, when the customer feels good at the end of the day, that's what generates, like, consistent business for you, and that's what's so important. Right. I, sure. I think that's, that's what really, you know, s- stuff like that is what really transitioned me from being, like, the guy that does handyman work to the guy that owns a business. Um, right. 
and it was all after like you know reading reading books and studying and learning the craft and mm -hmm. yeah that's good so roger what uh what kind of parting advice would you have for people that are looking to get into kind of not necessarily just furniture assembly but maybe niche down their their business to a specific category or whatnot or even getting started in the handyman industry what kind of like info or parting advice would you have for them yeah, I mean, I, I think um, I, I definitely wouldn't be where I am now without my experience as just being like a general handyman. Um, so I, I wouldn't want to overlook that aspect of it either. Um, you know, if, if if you're crafty and you're good with you're you're good with your hands and you're interested in jumping into the handyman world, I would absolutely recommend it so that you can learn what you like and what you don't like before mm. you niche down. So it's it's kind of like going to college, like you know, <laughs> you go in without a major. And just figure that out while you're in there, while you're kind of discovering yourself. Um, mm. so I think, um, yeah, before you niche down, if you just want to make sure, like, you know what you like and what you don't like, then, um, you know, becoming a handyman is is definitely that. Um, yeah, like, like you're going to make mistakes and you're going to trip up a lot. I mean, I'm still tripping up now. Um, but, like, you know, that, that's kind of, like, how you learn. And that's how you, how you grow is just by making mistakes. Uh, yeah, I would say, like, don't be afraid of that either. And, uh, and when you do decide to niche down and um, discover what you want to be like a specialist in, um, the great thing about that is like you can research that. Like you can you can actually Google a term. So like you can, you know, if you want to be the toilet guy, if you want to be the drywall guy, you can Google like how people like are doing it. And then you can figure out what you can do to make it better. Um, hmm. what other, you can see what other people are finding success in and you can figure out you know, your approach to being like the unique guy in that space. Um, and so that, that's why I think that's the great thing about being able to specialize is you can really focus everything, not just your marketing or your business operations, but really just like studying and focusing because you can just limit your search to just drywall or toilets. Um, mm -hmm. You don't have to search like everything. You don't have to learn everything. Hmm. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, Thank you so much, Roger, for all of your insight. It's been absolutely awesome having you on this podcast. And obviously, you know, we don't have enough time in kind of a 40 minute, one hour podcast here to hear your whole story. So we'll have to have you on again sometime. Um, but we really appreciate your insight and kind of what you do for the handyman industry. And also for all the listeners out there, we thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Handyman Success Podcast. Um, I am Alan Lee, uh, one of the, the co-hosts here. Uh, I run handymanjourney.com, a business coaching and consulting platform. Uh, we currently have uh, open enrollment to our Handyman Academy coaching group. If you're interested in that, you can also schedule a, uh, a free consultation with me at handymanjourney.com. And then Jason Call is our other co-host. Uh, he operates handymanmarketingpros.com. And you can also book a free call to talk with him. Um, he's, the, he's the guy for marketing. If you are interested at all in marketing, uh, websites, SEO, Google ads, anything like that, Jason is your guy. Go ahead and schedule a call with him there. And also, I want to let you know, Handyman Success, the brand is growing. We now have handymansuccess.net, um, and we are launching into doing webinars once a month. So uh, typically, they are the last Thursday of the month, but you'll need to go ahead and go register at handymansuccess.net to get your name into that. And we'll go ahead and get you some emails sent out. But thank you so much for tuning into this episode. Uh, we really appreciate it. We really appreciate any feedback you also have for us. So drop a comment on this video, wherever you're watching it. And we'll catch you guys on the next episode of the Handyman Success Podcast. Have a great day, everyone.